scripture reading this morning will come from Haggai 1, chapter 1, verses 1 through 6. In the second year of King Darius, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai, the prophet of Zerubbabel, and the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Zehazadek, the high priest, saying, Thus speaks the Lord of, of hosts, saying, This people says, The time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Then the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses, and this temple to lie in ru ruins? Now therefore thus says the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. You have sown much, and bring in little. You eat, but you do not have enough. You drink, but you are not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages, earns wages to put into a bag with holes. I looked up a while ago and I was really surprised to see Debbie here. Uh, I heard on the news today that she was somewhere outside of Florida. So. Uh, and it's supposed to make landfall tomorrow, so I, I don't, but she's here, so we're glad she's with us today. Uh, did y'all enjoy VBS? Yeah. Wasn't it great? Wasn't it great? Don't you love it when our young people have the opportunity to, to, to not just to, 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 to hear a lesson, but to participate in a lesson and to grow closer to God? I love that. I love, love those opportunities. I, I'd be in favor of VBS like, I don't know, my, I don't know if my body would be up to it for more than once or twice a year, but I'd be okay with the VBS in the wintertime too, uh, just because I love the opportunity for our young people, because they get excited about God's Word. And, uh, and I think the stories we had were really good, and uh, I know the set was really good, and I feel kind of empty up here without it today, but, uh, but I appreciate that. I hope you do as well, and I appreciate all the work that went into that. Got several out sick. Uh, apparently COVID's going around. Another round of COVID is going around. Maybe some flu virus is going around. I'm not sure what all's going around right now. Remember, if you're coughing and you're sick, don't share. Stay home if you need to. Don't share. Uh, and, and everybody will be happy about that. Uh, but today we're going to talk about Haggai. Haggai's an interesting guy, an interesting prophet. He... Uh, he, he was a contemporary of Zechariah, so he's in about the same time frame there as Zechariah, and both prophets preached to the Jews who had just come back from Israel following the captivity in Babylon. And so there's kind of a timeline of, of Haggai and Zechariah and Malachi. Uh, we don't know much about Haggai. We know he was a Hebrew prophet. We know he wrote the book with his name. He's one of the 12 minor prophets in the Hebrew Bible. By the way, do you know the difference between minor prophets and major prophets? I, I remember when I was growing up, I thought, well, minor prophets, their message must have been minor. No, it's their books are shorter. That's why they're called minor prophets, simply because their books are shorter. They were more concise in their speech. Unlike Paul, who preached till midnight, they only preached an hour or so. Uh, no, I'm, I'm kidding. I, we don't know, but their books are shorter. And so we... Uh, he's best known for his prophecy to command the Jews to rebuild the temple. That's in 520. Uh, and so if you look at the timeline there, you see where it says temple completed and Haggai and Zechariah. They're prophesying at about the same time there. It's about 100 years later when Malachi comes along. And we're going to learn more about him as we do that. They're the three post-exile prophets after the Babylonian thing. We don't know much about him because he doesn't tell us about himself. And nobody else really tells us about him. Ezra mentions him just kind of in passing. And, and, and so we have that from the book of Ezra. Uh, most commentators seem to think that he was a very old man by the time he wrote this. Because in chapter 2, when he talks about the glory of the former temple as compared to the current temple, it indicates that maybe he had seen the former temple with his own eyes. Now understand, they've been in captivity for 70 years. It's been 16 years since they started building the temple, and now they're building. He's, he's got to be up in his 80s, at least, if that's the case. 
He's got to be an older man. Uh, so uh, if that's the case, that's the that's something we can look at. Uh, and uh, and he and Zechariah are exhorting the people to go back to building the temple. What happened? They came back. They started building. Everything was going well, and then. Then a little bit of persecution came along, a little bit of hardship came along, the work got hard, the work got difficult, the leaders weren't really that enthused about that, and, 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 and they started building their own houses and rebuilding their businesses and rebuilding, they're rebuilding a city. I mean, that's what they're doing, they're rebuilding a city. They've got so many things going on that the temple work started falling by the wayside in the midst of all that, and so that's why he and Zechariah come along to encourage the people. And they're, they're encouraging the people, do what you can. Do the work for God. And, and so that's his primary message. They, they had laid the foundations of the temple. They had the altar restored. But like so many times in the past in the history of the nation of Israel, they started really well. They just didn't finish real well. They had no problem walking through the Red Sea, but as soon as they got on the other side, they were thirsty. They had no problem drinking the water of Meribah, but as soon as they got through drinking the water, they were hungry. They had no problem with God taking care of them in the wilderness, but they didn't want to go and take care of what God wanted them to go and take care of. They started well. By the way, do we ever do that in our own lives? We start out well. We have a great idea. You know, I'm... We, we call them New Year's revolutions. Every New Year, somebody makes a revolution that they're going to lose weight or they're going to read their Bible more or they're going to they're be a better husband or they're going to be a better wife or they're going to do whatever it is. And we make these resolutions of things we're going to do. And we start out really well. I remember reading an article, and I think it was Gospel Advocate, many years ago, and, uh, and it was called Bogged Down in Leviticus. It was the title of the article. And it was about somebody who, had, who every year made a commitment that they would start reading through their Bible. And they did great through Genesis and Exodus. And when they got to Leviticus, they were done. They got all those rules and laws and they got frustrated and, and they ended up stopping their Bible reading at that point. Uh, thought it was kind of interesting because we are that way a lot of times. We're great starters, not necessarily great fishers. And that's the, that's the problem because not only is he encouraging them, he's chastising them just a little bit. He's chastising them a little bit. In, in verse 4, it says, Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses and this temple to lie in ruins? You know, I understand, and we'll talk about that a little bit, why they did what they did and how they did and how they came to where they're at. A little bit about that I understand, but... We're going to talk about that a little bit more here in a minute. But this is the exact opposite of what we saw with David. Remember when David was, was he, he comes up and he says, See, now I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells inside tent curtains. Look how noble David is. I want to build a temple to God. That's what I want to do. These people were being told they needed to quit building their house and start building a temple to God. He says, hey, I've got a nice house. God needs a nice house. But if you recall, the prophet told David, it's not for you to do. It's not for you to do at all. He did allow him to collect the materials and to design the house, but he didn't allow him to actually build it. Solomon built the temple. In this case, there was a man that's eager to build the temple and in the case in Haggai, they're a little less committed about that, it seems like. But before we cast stones at them, let's think of something here that maybe we might not always consider. David was rich beyond measure. And through the strength of his army and the power of his might, he had peace on all sides by the time he got around to saying, let's build a temple for God. Building a house for God wouldn't have really cost him anything. I mean, money. But he had the labor. He had the people. It wouldn't have really cost him anything at all. But he'd have received glory and honor for being the king that built the temple. As it was, he still receives honor for being the king of Israel. But if he'd have built the temple, think how much more honor and glory he would have received from that. These folks 
were not rich like David. They're refugees from exile. They're coming back home with nothing. They're coming back home because it's home, but they're coming back home because they've been exiled for years and they're coming back to ruins. The cities and ruins around them, the mom and dad's old business, if mom and dad had an old business, the roof's caved in, the walls are, it's been raining and pouring in, it's all gotta be torn out and rebuilt. Their houses and homes have to be rebuilt. They've gotta have all of those things in order to live and, and unlike David with all of his palaces, oh, I've got palaces, let me build a house for God, they don't have a roof. Many of them are living in tents. And maybe understandably, since they're facing enemies on every side, their focus is more on taking care of their needs right now than taking care of the needs of the temple. Maybe understandably so. I don't think we should cast stones at them because I think many of us might find ourselves in the same shoes if we were in the same situation. We might find ourselves with the same thoughts because that's what we think of when we think of the temple, right? Isn't that the picture you get? But it probably originally looked more like that. The part back here is just the very top. That's what we think of when we think of the temple. We don't think of how magnificent it was before. And so they're in the process of building it, and, and it's just more than they can imagine. And so as they worked and they began their work, they faltered. They got tired. They got a little discouraged. They got a little distracted by their foes. They got a little disheartened by the workload. They, they were a little dismayed with their own living conditions and, and so forth. And so they just, they faltered along the way. And, and whereas in times past, we see God's people with amazing sacrifices to build the temple. Here we have people who are willing to do it, but they've just kind of fallen to the side. They've just kind of lost the, the hope of it. Remember when they were building the tabernacle? Moses called to the people, or he talked to the people, and he says, hey, we need supplies to build the tabernacle. Exodus chapter 36 says, Moses called Bezalel and Aholiab and every craftsman in whose mind the Lord had put skill, everyone whose heart had stirred him to come to do the work. And they received, listen to this, they received from Moses all the contribution that the people of Israel had brought for doing the work on the sanctuary. They still kept bringing him free will offerings every morning. So that all the craftsmen who were doing every sort of task on the sanctuary came, each from the task he was doing, and said to Moses, the people are bringing much more than enough for doing the work the Lord has commanded us to do. So Moses gave a command, and word was proclaimed throughout the camp. Let no man or woman do anything more for the contribution to the sanctuary. You quit giving to the sanctuary. You quit giving to God. That's what Moses had to tell them. He had to command them to do it. And he had to command no man or woman because that way a guy couldn't funnel the money through his wife. He had to make sure they understood, no more. For the material they had was sufficient for all the work and more. Wow. Sounds like they were really zealous about building a tabernacle for God. A little bit later in 1 Chronicles 29, then the leaders of the father's houses made their free will offerings. This is the time of David. Before Solomon builds, while David's collecting the supplies, made their free will offerings, as did also the leaders of the tribes, the commanders of thousands and of hundreds, the officers over the king's work they gave for the service of the house of God, 5,000 talents and 10,000 derricks of gold, 10,000 talents of silver, 18,000 talents of bronze, and 100,000 talents of iron. That's not counting the millions of pounds, the millions of amounts of lumber and of what David gave just amazing when you look at that and you see what they did and how much they contributed. Ezra talks about these people. What he says is, then rose up the heads of the father's houses of Judah and Benjamin. These are the ones we're talking about now, the ones who were there that, that Haggai is talking to as he preaches. 
the heads of the father's houses of Judah and Benjamin, the priests and the Levites, everyone in whose spirit God had stirred up to go and rebuild the house of the Lord that's in Jerusalem. This is the first time they went back. All who were with them aided them with vessels of silver, with gold, with goods, with beasts, with costly wares, besides what was freely offered. Cyrus the king also brought out the vessels of the house of the Lord that Nebuchadnezzar had carried away from Jerusalem and placed in the house of his gods. Cyrus king of Persia brought these out in charge of Mithra. Mithridath, the treasurer who counted them out to Sheshbazar, the prince of Judah. Do you see what's happening here? When they started, they gave a big free will offering too. They were excited about getting the job done. Sometimes we can get so excited about getting the job started, but going on and continuing on is harder. Let's use a modern day illustration to make it easier to understand. I can't tell you, I probably could if I stopped and counted, the number of times I've stood at the front of a church building with a young groom and watched the bride walk in for the first time. There's excitement there. There is excitement. There's excitement back in the back, too, coming this way when she sees him for the first time that day. And their eyes meet across the thing, and nobody else in the world matters as she walks up the aisle, and everybody stands up, and they watch her walk. And she's all arrayed in her beauty, and he's all adorned in his finery. And they're standing there, and they finally get to touch hands up here for just a minute. And you can feel the excitement in the air. But you know, after 20 years... They're sitting on opposite sides of the car. And by 40 years, they're riding in separate cars. You know, that excitement has kind of worn off a little bit. Are they still committed? Oh, yeah, they're still committed. Are they still in love? Oh, yeah, they're still in love. But the newness has worn off. You know, my wife now complains when I leave my dirty socks on the kitchen counter. Uh, I guess she's always complained about that. Never mind. Uh, that's not, that, that doesn't count. Uh, we had a friend in Alabama when Gail was complaining about that one day. Her husband had been missing for 15 years. She said she would give everything she owned to see his dirty socks hanging on her fireplace mantle again. And Gail says, no, that's not really what you mean. You're just, you make it an analogy there. <laughs> but having said that, here's what they gave when they got started. This is the things from the temple. 30 basins of gold, 1,000 basins of silver, 29 censers, uh, 30 bowls of gold, 410 bowls of silver, 1,000 other vessels. All the vessels of gold and silver were 5,400. Shishbazar brought them up when the exiles were brought up from Babylonia to Jerusalem. So they had all these things. They were ready to go, but they were having problems with their focus. They were having problems with their focus. That's what's going on there. They're worried about, how am I going to feed my family? They're worried about, how am I going to take care of the future generations? They're worried about what am I going to do when I'm too old to take care of myself? How am I going to have the, the wherewithal to do that? Where's a roof over my head? Where am I going to sleep? All of these things are bothering them. By the way, didn't Jesus address that? Didn't he say that all the Gentiles, and, and he meant everybody, everybody's worried about all of these things. He said, but God knows what you, needs you have. And he said, trust God and he'll take care of them. That's what we say, used to sing and still do sometimes. In Matthew 6, 33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. That's what these people needed to hear. That's the message they needed to hear because they weren't seeking God's things first because they'd lost their focus. And so the book of Haggai gives us four different messages that kind of try to bring them back into focus. They happen in, at four different times, so we're going to talk about the four different times. First one happens in the second year, on the sixth month, and the first day of King Darius' rule. And so there's a message there to Zerubbabel, the governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the high priest. The people say it's not time to build a temple. We read that from verse 4. The people say it's not time, but they're building houses for themselves while God's house lies in rules. God's not opposed to home ownership. That's not what he's talking about here. 
God's not saying, well, you can't have a house. God's saying you've got your priorities in the wrong place. That's what the real message is. Their priorities were in the wrong place. It's expressed in the idea of house building and house ownership, but it's talking about priorities being in the wrong place. And he's concerned they've been neglecting service to him while they've been serving themselves. And, uh, and the message is in verse 7, consider your ways. Consider your ways. Think about it. God makes this statement twice in this chapter through, through Haggai as he does this. The first in, in verse 5 is, is that ungodliness has caused God to hold back their blessings. Remember that part you plant and you don't, you don't reap and you look and there's, and there's nothing there for all of your efforts, everything you do, nothing's being blessed because you're not doing it right. You're not doing it to bring glory and honor to God. And, and the second is in verse 7 when he says, you need to get back to work. You know, go up on the mountain, bring wood for the temple. And then he says, why? God tells him why he wants the temple built, so that he can take pleasure in it and be glorified. It's not about them. It's not about their homes. It's not about it. It's about God being glorified. That's what it's really all about. A little bit later, in the seventh month, so a month later on the 21st day, so, so we're talking a month and a half. You know, we're talking about 45 days or so. Actually, if you did all the math, you probably come up with that 60 days, but still. A month, and, a month and a half later or so, he speaks to him again. And he comes to him, and this time he says, he says, you know, God wants you to build, build the thing. Do you remember what Solomon's temple looked like? Do you remember how beautiful it was, all the adornments? Do you remember how people came from all over the world to see it? And, and, and this is great, but it fails so much in glory to the first. But you know what? God says, I love it. I love it. I'll be with you. It's not about the temple. God doesn't need a house to live in. It's not about the, how fancy they can make the temple. It's about the fact that they built the temple for God in the first place. You know, you don't have to live a perfect life. You have to try. You hear me, church? That's what he's saying. We don't have to achieve everything perfectly. I don't have to live the same level of holiness that Jesus did, but I have to try. I have to do something. I have to get out of my shell and try to live the way he wants me to live. That's what he's telling them. And he's satisfied with that. He's satisfied with their best effort. Even though it's not as great and grand and glorious as it was, it's still great and grand and glorious to God. What a great message there is there when we look at that. A couple of months later, Ninth month, so two months later, almost to the day, on the 24th day, he goes to him again and he says, he, he, he asks this rhetorical question from God. Ask the priest this. He says, go to the priest and ask him this question. If one carries holy meat in the fold of his garment, and with the edge he accidentally touches bread or stew or wine or oil or any food with the edge of his holy garment, will it become holy? They're like, oh, no, of course not. They, they got that right. They understood that really well as, as uh, you know, uh, maybe God's trying to make a point here. By the way, isn't that the way you expect Jesus to start one of his parables? Yeah, it is. And it is the way he started many of his. And then he turns around and he says, well, if one is unclean because of a dead body and then he touches some of these holy articles, Will it be unclean? And the priest said, oh, yeah, it will be unclean. God's demonstrating here something very important, that the works of man can't make things holy. We can only make things unholy. God's the only one that can make things holy. That's what he's trying to show here, that God can consecrate things and make them holy. We can't do that. And so he wants them to understand that, that, that they need to carefully consider from this day forward how they've been punished for their sins. And yeah, he'll bless them when they're obedient. You know what? 
we're nearly three millennia removed from when this prophecy occurred. We're nearly three millennia removed from that, and we have the same promise they had. John puts it this way, if we walk in the light as he is in light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of his son continues to cleanse us from all sin. How wonderful is that? 3,000 years later, we have the same hope and the same promise that if we continue, we can consider from this day forward how to go. Same day. Kind of interesting that it's the same day. I don't know why he had to write it down as a different prophecy, but maybe they came at different times of the day, or maybe he talked to one group in the morning, another group in the afternoon. I, I wasn't there. I don't know. You'd have to ask Helen. Uh, but uh, I shouldn't say that. shouldn't pick on her. She wasn't there. But she could have been if she'd have been born then. God's speaking to the governor of Zoot of Judah through to Zerubbabel through Haggai and he promises he's going to overthrow the Gentiles and he says I'm going to bless my people and he says his kingdom's going to be something amazing isn't that what Daniel prophesied in Daniel 2 and 44 in the days of those kings the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed nor shall the kingdom be left to another people to break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. He's talking about the church there, the kingdom of God that's coming. And he says, it's going to come because, as he says to Zerubbabel, I have chosen you. He says to Zerubbabel, you'll be my signet ring. Now, a signet ring is kind of an interesting thing. I, I wear a wedding ring. And uh, at times past, I've worn a class ring, and at times past, I wore a ring that said U.S. Navy, and at times past, I wore a, a little pinky ring thing that, that was my uncle's that I wore for a while. I've worn various kind of, but a signet ring is pretty special in that it has the emblem of whoever the person is. And what they would do, if they were sealing something, they would put a drop of wax there, and they would press the ring down in there, and it would make the symbol of whatever it was. That's the signet ring. It would seal whatever it was to be true, verify that it came from where it was supposed to come from. And he says, Zerubbabel's going to be my signet ring. God's saying, my kingdom seal, power, is going to come down into you, and you're going to have great responsibility and authority. By the way, doesn't that continue down to the church today too? Peter writes, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks is one who speaks as oracles of God. Signet rings of God. Oracles of God, speaking with the authority of God. See, it carries forward to us today. Whoever serves is one who serves by the strength that God supplies. In order that in everything, see, here we go back to why they were doing what they were doing in the first place. That God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. You see, we're supposed to be the oracles of God. We're supposed to be the signet ring of God. When we speak the word of God, it should be sealed by him. It should be sealed by the truth. And we ought to be speaking the truth all the time. And the purpose for our devotion, the purpose for our rebuilding the temple, the purpose for our honoring the temple that the Spirit resides within, is to bring glory and honor to God. It's not about us. It wasn't about them. We start well. Remember when you were baptized? For some of us, it's far enough back that we may not remember all the details. I tell you what you probably do remember, how pure you felt. How pure you felt and how thankful you were that all your sins were washed away and the promise and the hope that you had. We started out strong. Are we still going strong? Or has the newness worn off? Are we sitting on opposite sides of the car? Because that happens sometimes if we're not careful. The greatest works of man are nothing in comparison with God. And only when we obey him and give him glory can we find our true purpose and value. That's the lesson that we get as we read through Haggai. We need to consider our ways like they did. And we need to continue strong. The book of Ezra begins with a decree from King Cyrus of Persia. 
It allows the Jews to return to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. It, it happens somewhere around 539, 538 B.C., somewhere around there. Uh, the first year of King Cyrus is when this happens. And so we get kind of the idea of this. Cyrus was doing his work as the king. He's pursuing his own national interests. He's pursuing his own personal interests. But God is using him to take care of his own interest, And we see that. And God is still helping today for them to accomplish his will. We'll give a few questions, then the lesson will be yours. You remember Naaman? The story of Naaman, he had leprosy. He went to Elisha, and Elisha told him to do something. Remember what he was told to do? Supposed to dip seven times the Jordan River, right? We remember that probably. Uh, when he got all indignant about that, what did his servant ask him? He said, well, if he'd asked you to do some great thing, wouldn't you have done that? When Haggai asked them to do some great thing, did they do it? They did. They rebuilt the temple. It took several years before it got to its full glory again. What if God asked you to do some big thing? Would you do it? If God asked you to do something that took every bit of your intelligence and energy and abilities, would you do it? If he asked you to give him everything to do some one project, would you do it? What if he asked you to do some little bitty thing, like sharing your faith with your neighbor? Would we do that? You see, the purpose for Haggai's story being in there, I believe, is to show us that no matter what the task is, God needs to get the glory first. And if God gets the glory first, the rest of it will take care of itself. Maybe this morning you're struggling in your faith. Maybe your walk's not what it ought to be and you need to restore your faith. Maybe it's time for you to come to God and, as John says, to walk with him again because you've turned away. Maybe it's time for you to come to God for the first time and give him your heart. Maybe it's time for you to be baptized into Christ. Maybe today's the day that you can renew your vows and start over again, excited and fresh and not jaded. If you need to respond, won't you come while we stand and sing to encourage you?